So here we are. This is week. This is this is episode six of the election series podcast. <laughs> um, we were supposed to have a little panel that fell through, didn't end up working out tonight. Next week, the final week is going to be women. We've got a, a panel of women. Um, but tonight, we almost canceled this one. And then uh, we came across, um, I, I saw it on a Facebook scroll, Phil Vischer. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. He is the Veggie Tales guy. He did a series of, he does a podcast. And he, does a, he did a series of them, one of them on politics and uh, I watched it with my wife Jess, and then I thought, hmm, "This is really, this is interesting. It's 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 worth talking about." And uh, I shot it off to Tom this morning, and uh, he was like, "Let's let's do it. Let's talk about it." So this one's a little different. What we're going to do is we're going to play this video by Phil Vischer. It's a 15-minute video, and then Tom and I are just kind of just going to discuss it a little bit. I'm going to share the screen, and then Tom and I will be back to to discuss it. Okay. Why do white Christians vote Republican and black Christians vote Democrat? Everyone knows conservative Christians vote Republican. It's like one of the rules of nature. The sun comes up in the east and conservative Christians vote Republican. Unless they're black. Oh, right. Most African Americans self-identify as Christian and most African Americans vote Democrat. Look at the numbers. In 2016, 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump. For many Christians, it's just assumed the Republican Party is the party for Christians. But what about black Christians? Pew Research interviewed validated voters after the 2016 election. People they could verify actually voted. When they looked at black Protestant Christians, there is no official category for black evangelicals because most pollsters have decided evangelical is a white term, but that's a whole different video. When we look at black Protestant Christians, 96% voted for Hillary Clinton, the Democrat, 96%. So 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Trump and 96% of black Protestant Christians voted for Clinton. And it's pretty much like that in every election. White evangelicals vote Republican and black Protestants vote Democrat. Why is that? Don't they read the same Bible, pray to the same God? Which group doesn't understand that they're voting for the wrong party? To make things even more confusing, if we go back to 1890, these guys were Republicans, and these guys were Democrats. What happened? How did we end up where we are today? Well, let's go back and find out. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. Since they had this guy to thank for it, and the brand new Republican Party, and since most Southern slave owners at the time were Democrats, almost all African Americans voted Republican. In fact, the first 23 black congressmen were all Republicans. Not all Southern Democrats were these guys, but enough of them were that newly enfranchised African Americans were not likely to vote Democrat anytime soon. Most Southern Democrats considered themselves conservatives. Now, that sounds weird to hear. Everyone knows Republicans are conservative and Democrats are liberal. But the two parties didn't shake out so clearly on conservative and liberal until the 1970s and 80s. Conservative Southern Democrats look back in history to happier days, the glory days of the South before Abe Lincoln and those darn Yankees messed up everything. Those darn Yankees. I think that's a Disney film. But Honest Abe didn't last forever, as you may have heard, and things got messy for black Americans pretty quick. Republican presidents kept federal troops in the South to ensure African Americans could vote. But when the 1876 election was in a deadlock with both parties claiming victory, America was in danger of falling into civil war again. A group of Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats met in secret and made a deal. Rutherford Hayes, the Republican candidate, would become president. In exchange, all federal troops, the ones protecting black rights, would be removed from the South. Yep, Northern Republicans sort of threw Southern black people under the bus. After the federal troops were gone, the guys in the pointy hats clamped down hard. New Jim Crow laws stripped away many of the rights they had just won. So for many black people, the Compromise of 1877 felt like a betrayal at the hands of the Republican Party. 
Then comes the Great Migration. Living with these guys in charge wasn't much fun, to put it mildly. So millions of African Americans abandoned the South for jobs in new factories in northern cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. And guess what? In the North, you could vote. Many transplanted African Americans still felt a loyalty to the party of Lincoln, but given the fact that no one in Washington was paying much attention to the needs of black families, the NAACP in 1926 argued that blacks should be loyal to neither party. Between 1868 and 1898, 22 African American representatives were sent to Congress from the South. After federal troops left, Bourbon Democrats' elimination of black votes was so complete that when Oscar de Priest was elected to Congress from Chicago in 1929, there hadn't been an African American in Congress for 30 years. Like all the black congressmen from the 19th century, de Priest was a Republican. And then the Depression. Black workers in northern cities were hit hard, with unemployment rates twice as high as white workers. Underwhelmed by Republican President Herbert Hoover's response to the crisis, Americans of all stripes, including African Americans, found hope in the progressive New Deal programs of Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat. Roosevelt received overwhelming support from northern black voters. When the next African-American candidate, Arthur Mitchell, also from Chicago, won a seat in Congress in 1934, he was something Washington had never seen before, a black Democrat. Over the next 20 years, African-Americans continued voting for both Republican and Democratic candidates, and various civil rights measures were proposed by both Democrats and Republicans. Though today this seems hard to believe, there used to be conservative and progressive wings of both parties. In the Democratic Party, the progressives were northern urban Democrats. The conservatives were the southerners, which, of course, included these guys. In the Republican Party, the progressives were folks like the liberally-minded Rockefeller family. For years, to be a progressive Republican was to be a Rockefeller Republican. The conservative wing was made up of those who wanted the federal government to stay small and stay out of their business. Both conservative Northern Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats opposed the federal government getting bigger and launching more programs. So from the early days of Roosevelt's New Deal right up through the 1960s, a coalition of conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats managed to block just about every attempt at new civil rights legislation. In fact, between 1953 and 1965, more than 120 civil rights measures were considered by the Senate. Almost every one was killed by the Senate Judiciary Committee, a powerful committee at the time controlled by Southern Democrats and conservative Northern Republicans. As the years went by, many more of the new civil rights efforts were proposed by Northern Democrats and fewer by Republicans, motivating more black Americans to vote Democrat with regularity. Yet Southern Democrats were still stalling or blocking nearly every bill. The strain between pro-civil rights Northern Democrats and anti-civil rights Rights, Southern Democrats was reaching a breaking point, and that break would radically alter American politics. Meet Strom. Strom Thurmond ran for president in 1948 and served in the Senate from 1954 till 2003. Yes, that's a very long time. His career almost perfectly illustrates the shift in political parties over the last 80 years. Strom Thurmond was a Southern Democrat and governor of South Carolina in the late 1940s. He hadn't had a huge problem with Roosevelt's New Deal since Roosevelt didn't mess with segregation in the South. But when Roosevelt's Democratic successor, Harry Truman, integrated the Army in 1948 and proposed aggressive civil rights legislation, Southern Democrats like Thurmond had had enough. Thurmond and a group of Southern Democrats protested by forming the State's Rights Democratic Party, a conservative party dedicated to preserving segregation. Thurmond ran for president against Truman in 1948. A sample of his stump speech, there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. No Negroes for me, thank you. That was pretty much it. 
Thurman lost to Truman badly, and his Dixiecrat party, that was their nickname because states' rights Democratic Party was a mouthful, the Dixiecrat party disbanded. Thurman ran for Senate as a Southern Democrat and spent the next 20 years fighting to maintain racial segregation in the South. But the tide was turning against the segregationist Southern Democrats as progressive Northern Democrats and Rockefeller Republicans tried again and again to pass civil rights legislation. In 1960, with civil rights protests really heating up in the South, Northern Democrat John F. Kennedy won the White House. Kennedy was initially reluctant to take a strong stand on civil rights, fearing he would lose all Southern support for the rest of his agenda. But after watching attempts to integrate Southern universities end in violence, Kennedy spoke up. In a speech to the nation on June 11, 1963, Kennedy labeled civil rights a moral issue and promised a major civil rights bill to end discrimination against African Americans. Five months later, Kennedy was assassinated. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, vowed to finish the fight for civil rights in honor of Kennedy, and propelled by goodwill toward Kennedy and aided by progressive Republicans, Johnson was able to pass the raft of legislation that would end segregation in America. For segregationists like Strom Thurmond, the fact that Johnson, a Southern Democrat, had led the charge was the last straw. In 1964, Thurmond announced that going forward, he was a Republican. Over the next few years, segregationist Democrats like Thurman jumped to the Republican Party in droves, and the South began shifting from blue to red. The identity of the Democratic Party as progressive was settling in, and a new wave of conservative Republicans was about to shift the brand there as well. The Republican candidate for president that year represented a new conservative turn for the party. Barry Goldwater was definitely not a Rockefeller Republican. He hoped to pick up disenfranchised Southern Democrats by opposing the Civil Rights Bill. And his message of states' rights and limited federal government sounded a lot like what segregationists had been saying for years. As a result, Goldwater won the Deep South, but failed in every other state except his home state of Arizona. Four years later, Republican Richard Nixon tried again, appealing to white suburbanites frightened by scenes of urban riots on TV with his message of law and order. Goldwater and Nixon were experimenting with a new Southern strategy, focusing on the newly christened Sunbelt states from Florida to California, and appealing to conservative white voters who felt the country was changing too fast and headed in the wrong direction. Nixon figured if he turned the South red, he could win the White House without needing to appeal to urban liberals or black voters at all. He was right. Fast forward to 1980. Ronald Reagan raised eyebrows by launching his presidential campaign in the Deep South with a pledge of support for states' rights. Critics took it as a coded appeal to Dixiecrats, the old states' rights party of segregationist Southern Democrats. The fact that Reagan launched his campaign and talked about states' rights in a Mississippi county best known as the site of the murder of three civil rights workers didn't help. Reagan's political and social conservatism built on Nixon's prior success and turned the South bright red. Between 1968 and 1988, the Republican Party had become the party of white, Christian, conservative America. And the Democratic Party was now the party of radical progressive leftists and hippies. Oh, and black church ladies. Right. About that. Black Christians are socially conservative. They're theologically conservative. So why aren't they politically conservative too? Black Christians and white Christians vote very differently, partly because their histories and life experiences are vastly different. When white Christians look at the Supreme Court, for example, they see the reason abortion is legal and school prayer isn't. But when black Christians look at the Supreme Court, they see the reason they can vote and pursue housing and employment without blatant discrimination. That difference in perspective has a huge impact on whether you see the federal government as part of the problem or part of the solution. Having the right to hear a Christian prayer in your local public school doesn't mean much if you're not allowed to attend your local public school. And think about the words progressive and conservative. A progressive believes things should be improved by making progress, by moving forward, by progressing. A conservative believes the good things we presently have are at risk of being lost and need to be conserved, or even revived from the past. 
So the best way to explain why white Christians vote for conservative candidates and black Christians vote for progressive candidates may simply be this. What do we see when we look in the rearview mirror? White Christians see a simpler time when everyone went to church, when we prayed in school, when abortion was illegal and gender roles were clear. When black Christians look in the rearview mirror, the view is very different. They see fire hoses and church bombings and lynchings. They see Strom Thurmond saying, we will never let Negroes into our theaters, swimming pools, homes, or churches. They see white Christians applauding Strom Thurmond for saying that, and then re-electing him to the Senate for five decades until he dies in office in 2003 at the age of 100. Is this beginning to make sense? There are other issues. Conservative white Christians see sin mostly as an individual problem, wrongs committed by one person against another, requiring only individual confession and repentance as the solution. Black Christians also see sin as a systemic problem, sinful systems needing broader solutions and broader confession and repentance. So to wrap all this up, it really doesn't help that we've only got two viable parties and that we've decided one is for people who want things to change and the other is for people who want things to stay the same. I'm oversimplifying, but you get the point. The Bible calls us to hold on to what is good while also working toward what is best, to conserve and progress. And neither party lines up with that very well. But I hope at least now you understand how Christians from different backgrounds can read the same Bible, pray to the same God, and come to very different conclusions about who's going to get their vote. I thought it was interesting, and, and, and in some ways it's helpful because it's a general, big, broad picture, but also big, broad strokes can be tricky at the same time. It's... Uh, it's 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 tricky with with history um i uh i i think though that from a from a bird's eye view it was uh it's a helpful picture of how um what you what you see in the rearview mirror it really does affect uh what you what you hear from different candidates and what you what you focus on what what stood out what stood out to you let's just kind of go back and forth and uh kind of ramble our way through some thoughts here yeah well to to your point, um, it's it's a good subject to go through because I think so often we see our point of view as so either right or so clear or so logical that you know the other point of view seems like how can anybody possibly have that? And it's easier to sort of ascribe that you know lunacy or that's you know sort of you know illogic to just random groups of other people that you don't have any association with. But when you're talking about people, you know in the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ who, who see things, you know, differently than you, it kind of makes you, you know, stop and think how, all yeah. right. And how I think, I think it, it gives you the opportunity to think how without being too condemning of them. Cause you, you know, you know, you share uh, a love for Christ, you know, because it can be easy to think, Oh, how can these, you know, these other people who are, you know, I don't like them already because, <laughs> because they think this way, like, how can they possibly think that they're just a bunch of idiots? But uh, you know, when you when you think how, and you're talking about a, a group of people that you share, you know, what most of us consider the most important thing in life with, when you share that with them and they see it entirely differently, kind of makes you reconsider um, how you're asking how they can do that. Like, yeah, from a from a more understanding position, I think, uh, or from a more benefit of the doubt position, at least. Yeah. Uh, to say how they see things differently. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, um, from 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 your understanding of 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 history, was there anything that you felt like was uh, misrepresented or um, too too broad too broad of a stroke? Um, not necessarily. He did a good job of sort of pointing out where the black people started in Congress, being all you know elected you know Republican um, areas and. He had gone through sort of generation wise, I think the Southern Democrats as as he was going through generally manned the, the KKK in the early days and then um, generally opposed civil rights legislation as it came up. I think at one point he kind of grouped them, he's you know, he grouped them in 
with some of the conservative Republicans who may have, you know, shared their the view. But if you look back on the actual voting um, measures back then, the majority of people who were opposing the initial civil rights legislations that came through were from the Democratic side. So if like the Democrats controlled the Judiciary Committee, you know, it was, you know, it might not be necessarily fair to lump them in equally, but even though they were, they were both involved. Right. Um, and one other thing, you know, just using, using the term states' rights as sort, sort of a, um, a code word for supporting segregation, uh, as it got on in, de in decades, I don't think was necessarily um, a fair assumption. That's, uh, you know, states' rights meant a lot more than just segregating people and trying to basically characterize Reagan as, you know, as being pro-segregation by doing that, I think was probably a misrepresentation uh, of his platform. But Barry Goldwater, from, my, from what I know about him, his, 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 his uh, version of conservatism that arrived on the scene I don't know where his heart was, but from what I understand about him, he he did not try to get the black vote. Like he was pretty adamant that th it's not worth trying to get the black vote. Uh, I'll lose I'll lose other whites, so um, I'm not even going to try much outreach. But from what I know, from what I understand about history, Nixon did try. Nixon didn't. Nixon did try to get. I mean, Nixon had uh, uh, had more outreach going, and he had uh, you know he he was trying to get appointees to the to the cabinet who were black um so I, so I did feel like that was kind of a, a a broad stroke i've um i'm reading a book right now called the loneliness of the black republican it's, it, yeah. it, it follows the black vote from 1932 to 1980 and the changes that took place and uh it's that's right along the lines of the video there so that's it does which is why when it popped up on my facebook feed i was like i was like oh, i'm interested in this Maybe that's maybe they knew that the algorithms knew what I was sure reading. They, did. they they had a thousand data points on you that pointed to that, and they popped it up for you. Yeah, like I'm I'm definitely interested in the intersection of civil rights and and politics. Like mm -hmm. that that is something I'm fascinated by. It's it's certainly more nuanced than than his 15 minute video could could share, um, but obviously there's a lot of truth to what he shared, and 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 it makes a lot of sense. Um, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's <clears throat> at some point hard to deny the numbers. Uh, yeah. There, yeah. You know, when you have such, such a, a vast, vast, vast majority, I mean, that's, that's as close to monolithic as, as, you know, on, on, as, as a voting block can get in some cases, you know, we're talking 92, 96% um, of a large group of people all voting the same way. And that is sort of the question I wanted to pose to you as you were talking about Goldwater not reaching out, Nixon sort of reaching out, um, I've you know, heard commentators say that uh, of the of the black population that basically nobody's working for their vote, right? no, because the vote goes so strongly Democrat, and like no Republican presidential candidate's gotten over thirteen percent of the black vote in sixty years. I um, mean, how much do you think it hurts? I mean, not just black Christians, but generally the black population to have such a a skew towards one side where you could argue that nobody's really working for their vote because it's, right. it's assumed it's assumed yeah yeah again from what i the, the, the what i know about history the prior 1964 th there were black politicians and and um leaders in the black community who were who strongly believed we need we need black leaders in both parties in order to in order for there to be competition and um and some of them stayed in the republican party even even after the new deal even after fdr jackie robinson is a you know he was he was he was a republican um up until uh i i, I think he switched to after nixon but I, i'm pretty sure he was he was he was uh supporting nixon um at least at first um but the after 1964, uh, it was, you know, after Goldwater ran, it really, uh, you know, just overwhelmingly went to uh, the Democratic Party. And that, yeah, I think the competition, um, you know, the, the two parties really competing to to do a better job for the black community sort of stopped. And it's a shame. 
I wonder if the same thing sort of happened with the evangelical vote in the 70s and 80s. You, you know what I mean? Um, with, with Roe v. Wade, after Roe v. Wade, I, I wonder if Republicans were just like, okay, we got them with those numbers as high as they are. I have a hard time believing that there's not a lot of backroom talks uh, about the, evangel the white evangelical vote, the black vote. Um, I mean, we've seen enough uh, cynical TV shows and movies to go, okay, even if half of that's true, both the black community and the evangelical community are probably getting a little manipulated. You know what I mean? And sure. you just... I said there's sort of cultural trends among the groups to, to ignore certain issues and focus on other issues so much so that it basically becomes cultural to vote a certain way. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, like I'm processing out loud, so I didn't have any real thoughts necessarily prepared. Um, but like, for example, 15 years ago, if a president started an office supporting gay marriage, um, that, that would have been a big negative to the evangelical community, right? Well, Donald Trump started an office supporting gay marriage. And he's got, I mean, he's got a... Uh, LGP, L LGBT for, for Donald Trump sort of group, um, because that's no longer a, a sticking point. That's, mm -hmm. we're, we're past that, so he can't afford to do that now. And mm -hmm. evangelicals are like, whatever now. But back then, that was such a cultural crisis point that evangelicals were lining up then to go, no, we gotta, we gotta oppose this. And now they're like, yeah, whatever, it's past. We're still gonna we, we still gotta rally behind Trump for other reasons. So it's like it's not just the groups, but it's also the cultural moment that you kind of uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And to to that point, it wasn't just Republican presidents coming in who weren't who weren't at least openly supportive of gay marriage and things like that. Trump is the first president to actually enter the office on record supporting gay marriage or at least not opposing it. Right. Even right. Obama, you know, had had spoken toward traditional marriage when he first started out and going back and forth, you know, it was going back, you know, present. So we got Democratic and Republican presidents who would not, who would not come out on that line as, as being in support of gay marriage. So do you think that was Democrats attempts to reach out to what they considered the Christian evangelicals by voicing support for traditional marriage as a, you know, and not supporting gay marriage openly? <clears throat> Either, either an attempt to to not lose the, the the you know the evangelical or Catholic vote, or truly believing that, and then later on switching in an attempt to say, okay, well, I'm I'm going for the you know more secular left vote. Then, I mean, again, looking at history, looking at the 1960 campaign with JFK, um, trying to. Um, uh, you know, deliberate on how much do we go for the black vote at the at the risk of losing Southern Democrats, and just kind of it just it just feels like such a game. It just feels like such a game to me. It, it does, and, and to me, I'll be honest. Like even though you know, I voted for him, like some of the some of the early on pleas and and the way to the Christian community that Trump would do, and you know, even sort of it seemed like unnecessarily emphasizing like God in speeches and stuff that is, that seemed counter to the rest of his speech or counter to his personality. Yeah. seemed like, you know, purposely throwing it in there to pander to Christians. I mean, I, I can recognize as like, I, I know what you're doing. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't really, I don't really need you to do this, you know, for me. And to me, again, I approach him pragmatically because I don't need him to necessarily reach out to me or pretend that he has more of a relationship with God than he does. Right. Like, just tell me what you're going to do. <laughs> and if I like that, I will stick with you. Like you don't need to pretend that you're, you know, as Christian as, you know, all these people you're trying to, to court votes from. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's just the most recent example. Um, I mean, I, I think, and I think honestly, on the other side, um, some of the democratic uh, candidates do that to the opposite side of the spectrum, the more like leftist you know, elements in their, group act like they basically support policies that you know they or you suspect or they've said before that they don't but now they're you know they're all about that and staunchly defending and acting like they're an activist for it their whole lives 
when really, you know, we know what you're doing. You're, 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 you're pandering to a, to a far portion of your, of your electorate. I, you know, it's, it's disingenuous, but I think it happens in, in both directions. Yeah. And as, on the Christian side of it, like, I think I can tell when I'm being pandered to <laughs> and I don't necessarily like it, but I mean, honestly, I, I sometimes I kind of hope they just get past that, be a little bit more realistic or uh, be practical, get, get to the practical nature of what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but do you think that we as voters, regardless of what, what group we identify with, enable that in politicians, enable that, that pandering and allow ourselves to be, to be used and treated as a group by, by still casting our votes and, um, uh, you know. I don't know necessarily enabling it is the answer because I'm not sure individually people want that sort of false um, accommodation, but I think maybe we encourage it if we're such a strict electorate like if we're such a monolithic electorate it's like well i gotta go for that it's a big voting block i gotta go for it you know that's 88 percent of white you know evangelicals i need to get or whatever the number was 82 percent um i gotta get it and so i gotta act like i'm i'm a, I'm a super christian my whole life like that's i think by our voting we encourage it um it it in a way, in a way, we encourage it. I think it's. I'm just trying to make the difference between enabling, like we're not asking for it, but we're gonna tend to elicit that response by the by a, a result of our voting. If it uh, here's a, a little bit of an obscure movie reference for you on that. Did you uh, see the '90s movie Blue Chips? It was Nick Nolte as a as a college basketball coach, and he had to recruit all these big players across the country. It's kind of like a shady program. Mm -mm, no. Right. Yeah, yeah, Shaquille O'Neal's in it. It's a, it's, it's, it's like a mid '90s, late '90s movie called Blue Chips. But in that movie, there's a scene, sort of like a montage scene of him recruiting like these top three recruits across the country, and he goes to each of their families, and he's, he's walk, going around with them, and they all bring him to church. To, but they're all different types of church. He's like, you know, uh -huh. First Baptist or Southern Baptist, and everyone is like, Yo, you First Baptist? Like, I was, I was raised First Baptist, and like, uh -huh. you like, Southern Baptist? Like, I was born in a Southern Baptist church, and then he's clapping down the aisles and stuff like that. So it's, it's like, you know. I, I see what you're saying, like trying to present something uh, as it's not to to gain your favor. But when it's so obvious that that's what it is, it is a bit off-putting. I think it does make you a look a bit foolish if you, you know, when you kind of buy into that. And I've talked to black people who who feel the way about that way about the Democratic Party, like the, where they they feel like the 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 Democratic Party is pandering to them. And uh, um, and I I have this theory that. Those numbers that Phil Vischer presented are going to change that we're going to see more and more black people voting conservative and more and more evangelical white Christians voting Democrat over the next couple of elections. That that's going to be broken up because I also know a lot of white evangelical Christians who almost feel like they're having this like, I was so stuck in a box in the 80s and 90s and I need to break out of it. And, and, I, and, and black people too. Like, wait a second. No, 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 no. This isn't, I believe conservative policies are better for the black community. And, uh, and white evangelicals going, wait, wait, there's other issues going on that I need to care about. Um, I don't know, do you, do you think, do you think that, that theory's crazy? No, I don't think that uh, theory's crazy. I think there's some, some elements of groundswell that have, have shown or at least that point to that, that you may be right. There's, you know, um, various mo like Blexit movements, you know, blacks for Trump, things like that, uh, that uh, seem to have gained ground uh, uh, in the years that, so w w it might indicate that uh, there's at least some movement within those communities to break the, the cycle of, of such heavy voting in one, in one direction. Um, the walk away campaign, I, I think, uh, from the Democratic Party started in the LGBT community. Brandon Straka, I think, is the guy who started that, the walk away movement. If you haven't looked that up, there's some there's some things online, people basically walking away from the Democratic Party from um, the LGBT community because they feel like they're not, they're taking them for granted and not really uh, addressing uh, them so much. So I, I think 
again, can't predict the future, but I, I think you are correct about that. And I can easily see your point about the, about white, you know, uh, Christians sort of breaking out of the, their mold because they think they're supposed to, you know, do it and say, Hey, there, you know, there's these other things or I, uh, you know, I feel like I've, I've been forced to vote this way by my community and now I'm going to break out of it. <clears throat> what did you think about this? The, the idea, the way Phil Vischer ended his video about how, you know, if, if we're re reading the same Bible, then we're going to walk away with, with the conclusion that there are some things that we need to conserve, protect, revive, and there's also some things in some ways that we need to progress into and we've got to we've got to embrace we've got to embrace both how, how do you how do you do that in a in this this, this two party system which tells you you got to do one or the other yeah i mean i think his concept there is is obvious on its face right you, there are some things you have to leave behind and some things worth holding holding on to um the problem is, I think the oversimplification that he was talking about at the end it has become people's perception and reality. Like one party just wants to hold on to everything, make everything as it was in the past. And they, and they can take that as far as they want. Like, let's say, you know, conservatives want to hold on to things in the past. So they really want to bring you back to segregation. They want to bring you back to, you know, you know all these discriminatory eras. And, you know, nobody's really, nobody, nobody is... Uh, wanting to hang on to that part of history, that's a fallacy, right? And, you know, there are not every liberal person or democratic person uh, wants to be like, you know, the most outrageous leftist in Seattle, you know, <laughs> so to speak. So the, uh, I, I think categorizing people according to groups with no nuance leads us to to have the perception that one group is all one way and one group is all the other way. And it's, it's just another element of that absolutism that I've talked about in a couple of different um, podcasts, but, you know, characterizing people as all one or all the other, or characterizing groups as all good or all bad. It's, it's just foolish and it's not reality, but it's becoming more of our perception and perception unfortunately becomes reality. So it's, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, I think it's dangerous. So, but that, so that's how I think people are viewing it. But the concept is, is right on. Like I want to, I want to hang on to things that are logical that have worked, you know, for generations and that fit my values. And some of those things have been emphasized in the past. I don't think they're issues of the past. You know, uh, I think they're things that have been emphasized more previously. And just because we're not emphasizing them now doesn't mean that they're not good, but it's not like I want to conserve everything that ever was like, yeah. Nobody wants to go back to segregation or slavery or, or not allowing women the right to vote or, you know, things like that. That's patently absurd. So you hang on to the things that are, are good, you know, or at, at least that have been beneficial. Uh, and you can name any number of things, free market economies that have, you know, bolstered prosperity and lifted people out of poverty and hang on to things like that. Um, and, and, progress in areas where, you know, progress, progress needs to be made, like, you know, had, had been done on eliminating those, you know, racial and gender barriers to voting and other rights, things like that, you know, cast off those and progress in those directions. So I think it should be obvious to really anyone with a sense of logic that that's the way it should be. But when you categorize parties or groups as all one way or all the other, um, it's hard to, hard to see them as, as adhering to that Christian principle of holding on to the good and, and moving past what's bad to what's best. Yeah. Hmm. Like, let me ask you, what, 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 what are you, the big issues for you right now that, that are timely? So timely issues, a couple, uh, a couple of things. And I, I, I still have, you know, some important issues. I, you know, the sanctity of life is always an important issue for me. So um, being more on the pro-life side is always important uh, for me. So that's that's more of a chronic issue, I'd say, as opposed to a, a current uh, issue that's uh, important. But um, the honestly, aside from that, my my biggest my biggest issues, I don't have like it's not like there's um, a specific crime. I'm not necessarily like like Jack was, who's who's been influenced greatly by the COVID uh, issue. I'm not convinced that, you know, 
one way is better. You know, one of these guys is necessarily better than the other uh, for that specifically. So I'm not, I'm not swayed by, by that per se. Um, it's more of an, an economic policy stance as far as encouraging growth and prosperity versus um, thinking you can tax a country into prosperity, um, which doesn't okay. work. So there's uh, economic fallout is probably the biggest concern yeah. um, that I have due to not personally, but as a country, uh, as, as a, as a whole, um, that's, that's probably the big thing. So my, my stuff, my, I guess my issues are more like chronic background issues. I'm not, tied up in one thing I got to have, you know? So yeah, my, my, my stuff's more baseline issues. I don't think I'm, I'm sitting on a one hot button topic right now. Are you? Good question. Um, yeah, abortion is always a, a big justice issue. That's important to me. Um, and, and, you know, and I was asking you guys last week, what's my vote going to do? Like, how is my vote mm -hmm. going to change that one? Um, fatherlessness, fatherlessness, especially in the black community, and which ties into the, 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 the prison system and how many um, percentage-wise blacks are incarcerated and, 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 and in prison compared to, compared to whites. Um, that's, something I, that's something I care about. And um, I don't know, but would you say, to go back to the progressive versus conservative thing, would you say that what Trump did with prison reform was a progressive move? I think in any sane uh, era, it would probably be portrayed that way. <laughs> I think I think in our current era um, of absolutism, it has to be. You know, if, even if you you know talk to progressive people, and he did bring in people for you talking about the First Steps Act, correct? Yeah. He did bring in people who are definitely across the political spectrum from him. I know like Van Jones was, was part of his, his team, you know, for that sort of, you know, working through the steps for that. So you think it's something that should be celebrated, you know, by progressive groups, but because, you know, there's, there's good versus evil, absolute enemy, you know, you know, all or nothing, it, it won't be portrayed or hailed as that way. But, yeah, I mean, I think that goes actually a little bit against sort of the sternest versions of the law and order crowd. Uh, and I think it made for more, um, I mean, a, a slight bit more leniency in the, in the crime and punishment department. So I, I think that would have to be considered a, by most standards, a progressive move, but you won't see progressives give them credit for it. And that's something that groups have talked about, you know, presidents have talked about doing and, you know, other politicians have talked about doing and just hasn't been done. And then it finally got done. So you'd, you'd think that would be something that would be pretty celebrated across the board. But um, I don't know if you remember the celebrations across the board. I don't. Trying to get back to the Christian perspective as the video uh, talked about it. Um, just kind of want to go through in what ways do you think that black Christians, I don't want to say hurt themselves by voting Democrat and similarly how white Christians hurt themselves voting Republican uh, from a Christian standpoint, not from all the other economic stuff, but from the, the life of a Christian and our values and what we want. How do you think we generally work against ourselves in the way we vote? Do you think we adjust God, our opinion of God's care based on our level of care for like, uh, for an issue? Like, do we, you think we, we, we assign a level of concern to God based on our level of concern for a topic? So you could say like, oh, you know, Jesus really, really cares about the unborn and this is, you know, a travesty and needs to be stopped. Um, you know, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible and you can look at that morally, but think, you know, Jesus cares about the poor too but not quite as much as he cares about you know, killing unborn babies. So really got to sell out for the abortion angle and not so much for the helping the poor angle. Yeah. Yeah. I do think we do that. And then, and then, and, and, and then, and then to the person, I mean, Jesus said, you know, Jesus told a parable in Matthew 25 that he's going to, at the end of the age, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats and the goats are, are the, the goats are the ones who, 
I uh, um, did, did not give a, a drink of, of water or food to the least of these um, in my name. And, and, you know, but, but those who, those who did, did it unto me, he said, and, and, you know, he, he, he uses examples like, like the, those in prison and, and the homeless. And um, I, I feel like we allow that the, 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 the political system to, to dictate what we care about instead of going like, all right, you know what, whatever, however this election falls, I, I got to care about the poor. I got to care about unborn babies. I got to care about my persecuted brothers and sisters. I got to put resources towards all three of those things, um, regardless of who wins the election. Do you think as Christians, we should expect the government to reflect what Jesus cares about? Or should we, as the church, primarily take control of that and not depend on the government to, so about the poor and the need, you know, the, the disadvantaged, should we require that from our government or should we look to ourselves, the church, more to spearhead that sort of thing? Oh, absolutely the church. Absolutely the church. I don't think we should expect the government to care about everything that we care about. What I think we need to be on guard against is us caring about only the things that our preferred political party cares about. I think that's where it gets slippery. Um, I don't expect the government to care about everything that I care about. That's fine. I understand that. And that's what I, that's what I mean. Like pragmatically, you have to vote. You have to pick a few issues every time you vote. And you have to say, all right, this time I'm voting for these issues and not these other ones like that's right now that's the reality you can't there's i don't think you can vote i don't think a, a christian can actually vote and say they're voting in a way that's going to support every single issue that a christian is called to care about mm -hmm. i don't think that's possible right now but i think the danger is becoming such a loyalist to that party that you forget about all the other things you're supposed to care about as a christian and you don't rally support for those other things. So if you're a Republican, like, man, you should, your resources should be going to the poor. It should be going to unreached people groups around the world and persecuted Christians around the world. And, and if, you're, if you're a Democrat, um, you should be putting resources towards the unborn and towards pregnancy centers. Yeah. And uh, like, that, I, I believe that, you know? I, 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 if you're a Republican, you should still be fighting for, um, yeah, I, I don't think, I'm, I, I don't think that uh, we should expect the government to care about everything we care about. I don't think that. I just think we have to be on guard against our tendency to find our identity so much so in that party that we, that we only care about what they care about, that we're following their lead, if that makes sense. No, yes, I understand that. So, you know, Chris, sort of, putting your identity in, in Christ first um, above, above allegiance to a certain side. Yeah. Almost like they're, they're a tool, right? The candidate, the, the party, it's a tool. It's a, it's a, it's a tool in God's hands. It's a tool that uh, um, we get to, we get to use, we get to leverage our vote. Um, but it's not the only one. It's not the only tool. It's not the only thing that we should be, um, looking to to affect change there's so many you know the, the church is so much bigger than a political party and we should act like it we should believe that um uh, agreed uh, from from the, to go, keep on this this sort of helping the needy and um underprivileged and those jesus calls us to help um just to see how maybe we can see things uh, from a different side, like the Veggie Tales guy was talking about. Uh, do you think there's some sort of a, a, a blind spot or a hypocrisy on both sides and how they approach helping um, the poor? Uh, for instance, if you have, and this is generalizations galore, but if you have, you know, or conservative people who are focused on financial stewardship, uh, so to say, low taxes, things like that, then they get characterized as, you know, being you know, pro, pro life and want to preserve life, but not wanting to, um, help the poor, not wanting to, you know, be taxed to help, you know, to help out the poor, which Jesus calls us to help and is, uh, undoubtedly, 
uh, a good thing. So it can get called out for what is considered hypocrisy, hypocrisy there. Uh, and then having on the other side, the Democratic or, or, or liberal side who are um, saying that, yeah, you know, they're saying those things, you know, you, you, you care about life, but, you know, you don't want to help the poor. I'm really, I'm really all about helping the underprivileged people, making sure everybody's on a, on an even, you know, playing field you know, financially and economically. But I want the government to make everybody else do that and pay for it. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking to personally invest in it per se. Uh, I want it to be mandatory that everybody, you know, is, is forcibly contributing to that. So do you think there is some, blind spots in the logic or hypocrisy on both sides as it applies to our call from Christ to help the poor. Sure. If you want to show me what you care about, your vote doesn't prove much to me. Your, your life does. And I think that, uh, you know, to, to your point, we, I mean, we may say we care about the poor and vote in a way that we say we care about the poor, but then our life is, you know, stingy and frugal and we never have time to do anything with the poor. Um, you may say that you care about the unborn and you give no resources towards helping, you know, women and couples in crisis or pregnancy centers or, you know, have no interest in um, actually doing something with your own life. It's, it, you know, it's pulling a lever and, uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know if we're going to stand before Jesus one day and Jesus is going to say, we are well done, good and faithful servant based on how you voted every, every two years or every four years. Um, I, and I, point. I think we just put a lot of stock into where people, and, and, and therefore I'm not saying we don't, we shouldn't vote, but I think we put too much stock in how someone else's votes and, 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 and we stereotype what they care about based on how they vote. And it's like, that's unfair. Like, like Andrew Aylett was on the racial, the racial series. And he talked about how he, him and Christine Aylett adopted, fostered and adopted uh, a black, a black kid. And uh, one of the reasons he said was because we're pro-life and we, we believe that we, that that's one way that we really have to exercise. If we say we're pro-life, we need to put our money where our mouth is. And that's one way that we felt called to do that. Um, but he votes Democrat. He's pretty, he's pretty open about that. And so could you say that, oh, you don't care about unborn babies when it's like, well, no, his, their life shows that they, that they, that they care about supporting life. And, uh, um, you know, they believe that more people should have babies, but then more people should be willing to foster and adopt some of those babies. That, that's where they, that's where they, that's where they land. But they're, but they're, they're Democrat and they probably get stereotyped by a lot of Republicans um, as not caring about the unborn. And like you said, you know, conservatives get stereotyped as not caring about the poor when a lot of conservatives are dishing out money left and right to charities and churches to care for the poor through organizations they're just not voting democrat that's all that's it and it's unfair and we put too much stock in in what where each other votes especially in national elections i'm still not convinced national elections really do a whole lot <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think local does more, right? I don't know. Yeah. What, do, what do you think? Does, does no, this... I think it's a shame we don't know more about our local politicians uh, because, I, you know, the, the old adage of all politics is, is local uh, has, a lot of, has a lot of clout. And we have, you know, 51 different uh, democracies going on in this country right now, basically, is, is, is the saying, you know, 50, sorry, 51, like, uh, laboratories of democracy, like yeah. each state, each yeah. state sort of, you know, uh, having their own different ways that they experiment with with, with what we're doing here, and yeah, I think there's more importance to that than it, it rightfully gets. Uh, yeah. uh, but when I go into the voting booth, uh, you know, I, I I know less as you work your way down the ballot. It's so know a true. lot about the president, you know, and you know, I'll know I'll know a bit about those running for like this the Senate, you know, the senators running in our in our state, or or maybe even a local congressman, but. I don't know any of those names on the school board and I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't even really know who's running for mayor of my, of my town per se. Yeah. So as, as the race gets smaller, I think our knowledge of it gets, at least my knowledge of it gets less. And that's probably more immediately important to me to know those smaller races. I just, you know, 
I just don't, I think we're conditioned to focus so much on national uh, and, and larger political races that uh, the, uh, the more local stuff, which is directly impactful, gets left to the wayside. But uh, yeah. But yeah, your, your previous answer, I just want to say you nailed that previous answer, Chris. I think that was, that was, that was good what you did with the uh, prior answer about your vote not being as important, as important as your life. Huh. I think that's, I think that's key. I think, you know, it sort of sits with the where, where a man's treasure lies, there too lies his heart. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your money per se. It's just your, your assets, your abilities, gifts, money, maybe. All right. The things that you have that you value in life, where do you put those into? Yeah. And uh, it could be your time, your effort, your work, um, your family, you know, bringing, bringing, you know, a child into your family who's in need. You yeah. Know, where your, where your treasure lies, there too lies your heart. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, if, if every local church man could rally and have a ministry for the fatherless, the poor, the unborn, um, refugees, and mobilize and weren't waiting and debating about which candidate was going to do more for which group of people. And they just were like, let's just, let's just get, sink our hands into helping these people groups in our neighborhood. I mean, things would be, things would probably be so much different, but I think we get hijacked by the game that is politics and the media that, that drives it. And Again, I'm not trying to say it's not important. I believe in being a faithful steward of, a, you know, our citizenship in a constitutional republic. I, I believe in that. Um, you know, I'm not one of those saying, "Oh, that's not spiritual." Get away from that. Not at all. Um, I just think we put too much stock in it, and we. I mean, you talked about this in week one. We either. Uh, deify or vilify we idolize or we demonize candidates as if this guy's where our hope is found and oh no uh you know if he doesn't get elected then where's our country gonna go absolute destruction hmm? whoa <laughs> eventually america is gonna topple we know that from scripture it's not gonna last like who says it's can't happen in your lifetime like it's gonna happen that jesus is coming back eventually um or or we demonize and 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 we, you know the the other person the other candidate and i mean they're not they're human and they're complex and i was listening to a lecture on uh, what harry truman and eisenhower did for civil rights and uh you know in 1948 harry truman came out in support of civil rights le legislation and um um, and, and wanted to desegregate, you know, called for the desegregation, uh, the integration of the armed forces. Um, and and some, one of the people on the panel raised the point like, well, yeah, he cared about it, but he also knew that he had a voting block there uh, who, you know, people who were going to vote, black people who were going to vote for him mm -hmm. as a result of that. And he probably calculated and weighed that very carefully. Um, it's like, yeah, of course, like, you just because people's motives are, are are not pure completely pure doesn't mean they're completely wrong either i mean none of our motives are completely pure all the time um so you know as a as a pastor can i say that i'm not that i make every decision just just me and jesus like and, and i'm not sometimes you know don't have other people's voices in my head of course, of course that happens. And sometimes I look back and go, I think I let that person influence me a little too much or mm -hmm. whatever. Like, that's going to happen. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, the manipulation that happens with different groups of voters, I don't think makes anybody evil either, you know, contrary to maybe how I made it sound in the beginning. I do think, I do think, and I'll say this for the recording, um, some of these issues, because we, we agree that the church should be stepping into them more, I think maybe come January, we do a series on just justice issues. And we take maybe a few weeks to talk about um, fatherlessness or um, um, the unborn, uh, the poor, and just talk about them, not, not only from a political standpoint and policy standpoint, but also from 
okay, what are what are nonprofits doing? What are churches doing? What are we as indiv- what can we as individuals do for these? Um, so you know, tackle them from a historical standpoint, a sociological standpoint, theological standpoint. Um, I would love that, but I, I, I would I would really like it if it were grouped to actionable yes. items. Like our church is going to step into the maybe you know point two specific you know either yeah. charities or starting ministries yeah. you know if so called in yeah. those areas so that the church can take a more active role or join other churches or other organizations currently taking a more active role. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I've said this to you. I've said it, I think in conversations with Jack Misk and then I've had that, you know, we, how we've abdicated our responsibility in these areas of the church. And I think we need to step up and do more and rely less on the government to do it. Cause you know, I'm not sure we should, should count on them or trust them to, to do it in a godly manner or, or care, care about what Christ cares about. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if everybody in our churches mm. spent one less hour watching Fox News or CNN and did something for one of those groups. Um, it would be awesome. Opportunities to volunteer, to donate, um, yeah. to support uh, organizations. I think it would be awesome if we could talk about those issues, what, what God says about those issues and the history of those issues, and then group that with action on those issues. I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'll support you. Anyway. I'll help out. I'll, whatever, whatever you want. I'm yeah, on. no, that sounds good. I, that's, that's why I'm bringing it up on, on the recording to you. I think, uh, I think that would be an appropriate, um, we've heard people's stories. We're talking about politics, talking about the election here, but I think uh, a spinoff of this um, should be, okay, let's, let's dive into these justice issues, understand them, and then create some action steps around them. Um, Absolutely, where where man's treasure lies, there too lies his heart. Like I, I truly believe that, and uh, I think I need to adhere to it more. I so, think we all do. I think yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Okay. Well, Lord, thank you for Tom. Thank you for uh, this podcast and this opportunity to talk and process things. Um, Lord, the, the election and, and politics can be confusing. Um, but I think Tom just, just, just said it best. We, we, we have a call as, as believers to care for multiple justice issues, um, multiple groups of people who are vulnerable, oppressed, marginalized, hurting. And uh, as Christ followers, we, we need to step into that. We need to give more time, more resources, more energy, more thought, more prayer to those uh, people to those 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 who are um, the least of these, and um, doesn't mean that our votes don't count. But but Lord, help us not to put our hope in 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 this election, uh, and and help us to put more more focus towards doing what we can do as as your people, your your church, your body. In your name, Amen. Amen.